It skips chapter 29. 29 is not involved. Then in 30, 31, 32, and 33. How many chapters that is? Mm -hmm. All right. So we are going to start right now and we're going to turn to chapter 26, which is laboratory markets of cardiac damage. Now, if I remember right, I gave you guys a handout for that. But I told you I didn't like the chapter because this chapter doesn't really answer those objectives. Okay? So I gave you a handout that answers a lot of the objectives. Study that handout I gave you. If you do not have that handout or you lost it, because I do not think that was on B2L, uh, get with me and I'll print you off another one. But you have to have that handout, yes. It was the one that you guys kind of filled out as we went. I had the broad topics down. You guys fill it out. Oh, yeah. There should have been, I'm assuming, I think there was key terms with that chapter. All right. So you need to know those key terms. What did I tell you was the best? And guys, this, this review is probably going to take a little while, so it's okay. No worries. What did I, got, what did I tell you about? What is the best test? If you could only do one test to determine if someone had a heart attack, what did I tell you you really need to think about? Troponin. Remember? Troponin is a test that allows for both early and late detection. I'm not saying it's the one that will stay elevated the longest, but when you consider everything, it's the best all-around test. Like, there's a test called a myoglobin. They don't do it a lot anymore for people that have chest pain, but that used to be the earliest predictor of a heart attack. Another one, that one rose the fastest. But then this proponent test came along, this protein, and it elevates about as fast as a myoglobin does. But the thing about a proponent is it's so specific for oh, your heart. Okay? Whereas myoglobin could be elevated just because you got you just worked out, you know what I mean? Or you just did something, some sort of strenuous activity. So if you see a test question that says, this is the best early and late indicator for a heart attack, what would the answer be? Troponin. Troponin. Now, if you see something that says troponin T or troponin I, just go with it, okay? Anything that says troponin, that's what I want you to know on. There is a difference between a troponin T and a troponin I, and you welcome to study that. Congestive heart failure. What's the test? There's a test that goes with congestive heart failure. BMP. I think it stands for brain nitrogenic peptide. But that is a test. If I could just only throw one test in the air for congestive heart failure, it's a BMP. Uh, then you had some vocabulary words. I'm looking at definitions right now on the exam, so know your definitions. We talked about a lot of drugs that are uh, kind of preventative things for heart attack. Like, what's something you can take every day that's supposed to kind of baby maybe aspirin. keep your heart attack away? A baby aspirin, right? Some doctors will tell you, like somebody like me that has AFib, they'll say, hey, you may want to take a baby aspirin every day. And they're not really necessarily trying to prevent me from having a heart attack. They're trying to prevent big man a stroke. Okay? But they also do the same for people that they may think maybe are at an increased risk of having a heart attack. Okay? Is take a baby aspirin. What do you think about why, why is it the baby aspirin? What, what's the deal there? It's the platelets. I'm sorry. Yeah, the platelets. It allows your platelets not to work, which in a roundabout way is a blood thinner. If you take a baby aspirin every day, I guarantee you, if you stick yourself in the finger, I'm not saying you'll bleed on everywhere, but you'll bleed a little longer than the person next to you would that does take a baby aspirin every day. I talked a lot of bit about, or I, I talked a lot of bit, a bit, a bit. I talked about <laughs> Nijoxin. Nijoxin. Okay, I told you out of all the drugs, that's one you'll test for a lot is digoxin. I believe in your notes that should be considered a cardiac glycoside. Okay. And that's the one that has the critical range that I told you about that you'll have to call frequently. Okay, 
Let's move on to chapter 26. Twenty-seven had to do with renal function. Now, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on this chapter, and there are one. I'm looking at two questions on the test that come from this chapter, but I did tell you there will be another creatinine clearance question on the test. Remember, the only difference between this creatinine clearance calculation and the ones you've done in the past is remember I told you I'm throwing in a body surface area. Okay, now that particular formula is on page 560. Page 560, that brown box on page 560 shows you the complete formula for a creatinine clearance. There will be one on the exam. We'll probably have a question that deals with giving you things like a BUN, a creatinine, and a uh, creatinine clearance, and you telling me which patient is the most in danger of renal disease, okay? Where you kind of put everything together all the time. You also need to know the basics, guys. I mean, just, I, you know, we didn't even really cover this chapter very well, but you need to be able to at least tell me the cortex is the outer layer of the kidney. Okay, you need to be able to tell me the glomerulus has to do with filtration. You need to be able to tell me what the what nephron is. What is a nephron? Mm -hmm. Functional unit of the kidney. Functional unit of the kidney. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, I appreciate the uh, guys asking questions and stuff while I was being evaluated. That I mean, thanks, man. Y'all answered a lot of the questions. Y'all made, or I hope y'all made me look good. I had a tough evaluation. So, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, Okay, so let's move on now to, I think the next chapter would be chapter 28, pancreatic function. There are different components to the pancreas. There's exocrine function and endocrine function. Exocrine function has to do with the digestion process of your body. In other words, your pancreas secretes digested enzymes that breaks down the food that we eat so it can be absorbed. Does that make sense? All right, but your pancreas also makes some real important things, one of them called insulin and one of them called glucagon, all right? And so you need to understand the basics of that. So there's two things the pancreas does. Endocrine has to do with glucose, leveling out glucose values. Insulin brings down your glucose, Glucagon can actually increase your glucose, but then also understand the exocrine component as well. Pancreatic enzymes. What are the two enzymes that kind of are directed toward the pancreas there? Lipase and amylase? Good. Amylase and lipase. So if I ask you a multiple choice question about that, you know, I won't put both of them in there, but you'll have to pick out one of them, all right? Uh, I do want you to know a little bit about the anatomy and physiology of the pancreas, okay? I, I've told you guys things like, kind of shaped like a tongue, there's a head, there's a tail, okay? There's a duct that drains into the duodenum, Okay, there's a pancreatic duct that drains into the duodenum. That's where those digestive enzymes are squirting. Okay, so know that as well. So if I talk about that the pancreas secretes hormones, okay, the hormones again are <coughs> insulin and glucagon, so that would be the endocrine, the endocrine component. I told you that there's about three major sicknesses of the pancreas. I hope I can remember. Okay, y'all name one. What's there's about three major illnesses that go with the pancreas. What's pancreas? Your yeah. Huh? Yeah. Pancreatic cancer. Yes. What's another? Pancreatitis. 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 That's two. What's another one? Um, this is the one everybody forgets. Uh, system fibrosis. Good. System fibrosis. Yeah, that's right. the three major diseases that go with the pancreas. Remember that. It'll probably be in the form of a multiple choice question, 
but remember those are the three diseases that go I think your book if I remember right I think that those three diseases make up about 95% of everything that can go wrong with the pancreas and that cancer pancreatitis cystic fibrosis what is the test that we do that can detect cystic fibrosis that I told you guys about? Oh, sweat chloride test. Yeah. Remember I told you guys that big story about how we can collect sweat from a baby and that is a screening test for cystic fibrosis? There's a case study that talks about that that you should be aware of. Move on to chapter 29 is body fluid analysis. I'm pretty sure you can skip that because you're taking a complete course on body fluid. So 29 is a freebie. And now we'll get to chapter 30, which is therapeutic drug monitoring. <clears throat> There's a question on the test that it's, it's multiple choice, but it's just where you rec where you recognize what therapeutic drugs are. Like if I told you, for example, if I said, is vancomycin, is that a therapeutic drug? It is, right? Because they draw vancomycin peaks and troughs, okay? And if I told you uh, digoxin, is that a therapeutic drug? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Now, they don't draw peaks and troughs on digoxin, but it is a drug that they have to monitor closely to make sure you're not in a critical value, okay? Uh, so, you know, be able to recognize throughout that chapter, it talks about all types of therapeutic drugs. It talks about vancomycin, gemmycin, cobramycin. Uh, uh, I think it talks about theophylline, digoxin. There's all kinds of them, but be able to recognize what are therapeutic drugs and what aren't. When do we draw, generally speaking, if I just ask you a point blank test question that said, when are, when are therapeutic peaks usually drawn? One hour, one hour before the dose. One hour after the dose, one hour after right? The dose. And then if I said, when are therapeutic troughs drawn? Just before they're fixing to give the next dose, okay? Now that's just generic. There are exceptions to the rule. What is one exception to the rule that I told you to always remember? It's a therapeutic drug, starts with a D. Digoxin. That is one that's an exception to the rule. Actually, you don't start drawing that until about eight hours after the dose. Okay? That is an exception to the rule. Just take my word when I tell you, read over digoxin, because I'm big on digoxin. I think that's important. That's one that you're gonna see at the link. Anti-epileptic drugs. Make sure that you know which ones those are. What's the most important factor in therapeutic drug monitoring? What is the most important factor in therapeutic drug monitoring? In other words, what is the biggest mistake you can make concerning therapeutic drugs? Uh, that's a good. That's a good uh, answer, but it's not right. The timing of the collection. In other words, if they tell you they have a vancomycin peak that is supposed to be drawn at one o'clock, you, be you can't there. go up there at four o'clock and draw that, right. or you can't go up there at nine a.m. and draw that. Usually, they give you fifteen minutes, okay, leeway. Now, so you see a question that says, "What's the most important factor of therapeutic drug monitoring? Timing of collection." <coughs> There are some questions that are just basic questions that I ask you about some of the more common therapeutic drugs. Like for example, if I ask you about a, this is a therapeutic drug used to monitor uh, uh, antibiotics given for gram positive infections, antibiotics given for gram negative infections, okay? Vancomycin, genomycin, tobramycin, just read over those. So there will be, there'll be questions on those. Okay, 
toxicology. We got some on page 630. Uh, you got some vocabulary words. I don't think you were given key terms for this, but I told you to know what TD50, LD50, and EB50 mean. Make sure you know those definitions. Remember that I told you to differentiate. Now, this really technically isn't in your book, but I hope you wrote it down while I wrote it on the board. But I'm big on knowing the difference between a serum drug screen and a urine drug screen. Okay? And a serum drug screen. Serum drug screen. Tell me some, I, I think I listed about four things that they generally do on a serum drug screen. Somebody name one of them. Tylenol, which would be another name for acetaminophen. acetaminophen. What's no drink drink? Alcohol. Alcohol. The other one mm -hmm. that sometimes falls into this category is called tricyclic antidepressants. Okay. Serum drug screen. Okay, in other words, they draw a red top tube and they do this on serum. Yep. What's the one below acetaminophen? The salic. Oh, uh, salicylates. Did I spell it wrong? Is it S A L I C or S? S A L I C. What? S A L I C one. It's right. Okay, salicylates. All right. Acetaminophen, acetaminophen, salicylates, alcohol, and tricyclic antidepressants. Those are generally done in a serum drug screen. All right? Remember, if you're, if you're drawing blood for alcohol level, you don't use uh, alcohol prep pad, right? Yeah. You got to use something else. Okay. Use whatever your facility chooses to use, but they will have something that's different. Okay, urine drug screen. I'm not going to name all of them. It's everything else. It's all, I call them the bad boys. Okay, it's the thing like cocaine, marijuana. Yeah. Barbiturates, benzodiazepines, amphetamines, methamphetamines, all of the ones that you think of, all right? Including what's more common today, steroids are also tested for in urine drugs. So I'm not going to write all those on the board, but be able to differentiate those. And a co worker that abuse steroids. Apparently, they make you sick. Okay. Now, I wrote those down like in those urine drug screens of abuse, I kind of gave you examples of what falls under benzodiazepines, like the common drugs that fall under the classes. No those. Like be able to give me an example of a barbiturate. Be able to give me an example of a benzodiazepine. All right, there's a spot in that chapter that breaks those down. Like for example, I think, I, I don't think this one was in your book, but I told you that Xanax is, for example, is an example of a benzodiazepine. So be able to give examples, because those are just broad classes. When I tell you amphetamines, there's lots of things that you consider an amphetamine. So don't just know amphetamine. Be able to kind of give examples. What's another name for marijuana? Cannabis. Cannabis. Cannabinoids, okay? And I'm saying that for a reason. I think that's important because a lot of times, you may think of it as marijuana, but what's on the reagent that you have to go in the walk-in and get to test for marijuana, it may say cannabinoids. Okay, that's the active ingredient. THC, okay, and cannabinoids and marijuana, they all go together. So be able to associate those names with one another. about different tests for the drugs. Remember, there's really two tests that go with a urine drug screen. There's a screening test, right, that like we would do at the hospital, and then there's a confirmatory test. Remember how I told you, for example, remember the drug screens we did in there for lab? And I told you this is an immunoassay. I, I wrote it out on the board. It's basically, it's antigen antibody reactions, okay? That's a screening test, but for a confirmatory test, you would have to use something like gas chromatography using a mass spectrophotometer, right? 
you guys may never do a, a confirmatory test. If you work at a clinic or at a hospital, you're doing the screen. I think I brought up and I told you guys when we were at Baptist, remember the tech at the huddle we went to? Remember, they were saying, remember guys, you have to footnote anytime there's a positive. If, if I'm working at National Park Medical Center, I got it. If I'm working at National Park Medical Center and uh, and Darren comes in, he's been in a car wreck, uh, he's kind of comatose. This isn't a chain of custody drug screen. This is just where they get a urine sample from him and they send it to the lab and they say, do a, do a drug screen. We do a drug screen and Darren comes back positive for something. Most places you have to footnote in there, realize this is just a screening test. Basically you're covering your tail, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're like, if you want verification of this or if you want to know how much marijuana he's tested positive for or which type of ingredient of amphetamines he's taking, then they would have to send it off for a confirmatory test that's usually sent to a reference laboratory, okay? Circulating tumor markers. Uh, you add some vocabulary words with this. We need to know those vocabulary words. Um, you know, we just covered this material, so I know you guys know what's important, but I, I definitely would study all of those cancer antigen tests. Like, you need to tell me, even though. One thing you need to definitely know is that there is not a perfect screening test for cancers, okay? There's just not. Um, but if I tell you, for example, and I say, okay, a CA19 type 9, what type of cancer is that test utilized for? What did you say? CA19 type 9. Cancer. That's not pancreatic. Pancreatic. Not ovarian. No, it's pancreatic. Pancreatic? Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you're talking breast cancer, it would be a CA15 TAC3. There's also another one with metastatic breast cancer, a CA27 29. Okay. And then ovarian cancer is CA125. Yeah. There's a nice little chart that talks about all those. Okay. That's easy stuff. 650. But, but trust me, it'll be worth your while to know those. Uh, you know, I just think it's important that you're going to be a tech working in a lab and you see all these cancer test orders. You you need to at least kind of know like what I want to test, right? Table. Okay. Now, there are enzymes that can be used as cancer testing too, remember? What's that one enzyme I told you that kind of breaks the rule? Um, it, it doesn't end in A's. It's not. Oh, no, the prostate thing. Yeah, the PSA test, the prostatic specific antigen. That is technically, in your textbook, that's considered an enzyme, all right? So that would be an example of an enzyme. There are hormone testing. Remember when I kind of had that talk to you of uh, endocrine things like uh, uh, the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor that they do back in histology on the tissue itself, okay? Uh, so there's different types of things that they use as tests. Now there's something that they can use as, uh, uh, remember, oncofetal antigens. Remember I told you there's this crazy thing that happens. There's certain substances that are present during fetal development. It's the alpha beta protein and then that's the EA. Yeah, and they don't know exactly why, but these analytes that are present during fetal development, there are certain types of cancers that people get, and then out of nowhere, this analyte comes back. Well, you don't want it coming back, but if it does come back, that can be telling the physician this person may has cancer. Now, Wendy mentioned the CEA. Even though it is not a screening test, what is that one associated with? What? Nope. Oh, CEA. Oh, colorectal, yeah, fecal colon cancer. Colon cancer. Now, we mentioned the alpha feeder protein that we talked about actually a little bit in today's lecture, AFP. Liver cancer. In places like in Asia where they have a lot of actual primary liver cancer called hepatocellular carcinoma, 
they actually use the AFP as a screening test for liver cancer. They don't do it in the United States because uh, liver cancer is really not that prevalent in the United States as far as where cancer starts. Like there's, there's not a, I mean there is, but there's not a major problem with people that get primary liver cancer. A lot of times in the United States, if someone is diagnosed with liver cancer, it's spread from somewhere else. See what I mean? Yeah. But in certain areas, like in Asia, they have a problem with liver cancer over there, so they use that AFP test a lot more. these vitamin deficiencies like I told you guys for example what goes with uh, what's the disease state that goes with a uh, vitamin C deficiency called scurvy Scur Scur okay go through each one of those and know the disease state that goes with it okay for example if I told you if I asked you a test question and I said look what vitamin do people or do women that are pregnant, what's one vitamin that they really need that their body actually needs more during pregnancy at other times? Folate. Folate, yeah. right? Uh, I might ask ask you out of the following, which vitamins are, which, which one of these vitamins is actually produced by intestinal bacteria? K. Vitamin K, there's another one too. B12. Folate. Folate. Folate is sometimes produced from corn or flora in the intestine as well. So make sure to know the diseases that go with the deficiency state. And I guarantee you there's a question somewhere on the test that where you have to differentiate fat soluble vitamins from water soluble vitamins. Okay, remember fat soluble or ADAC vitamins A, D, E, and K. Okay. What if you're deficient in vitamin E? What will that cause? What? Yeah. Right, your red cells are going to be fragile. Hemolytic anemia. So it can cause hemolytic anemia. You're deficient in vitamin E. But also remember those tests that I told you like. Oh. For, they normally don't order a vitamin E test. They order tocopherol oh. for vitamin E. Remember me telling you that? They don't order vitamin A tests. They order retinol, okay, yeah. to test for that. What test do they order for vitamin K status? Uh, uh, e oh, PT? Oh, time. time or PT. Yeah. Okay. That's usually the test that they'll order to assess your vitamin K status. Night blindness. What vitamin deficiency is that one? Vitamin okay. is nine pages long uh, it is 50 multiple choice 51 52 53 and 54 are essay questions and then I also have on the test I've got I'm kind of going against the norm but I've got some definitions where you write out the definition I have the word you write the definition okay Questions? How many points is it? Uh, uh, the multiple choice, there's 50, so that's 100 points right there. It's well over 100 points, but remember, every test you take in chemistry, no matter how many points it's worth, it, it will be treated as the same as the last test you take, as far as it being weighted. Now remember, in case I've forgotten to tell you for the urinalysis class, I have not added the extra 10 points for those of you that, uh, well, I don't think I have. No, you haven't. No. Okay. I have not added the 10 points for those of you that did your PowerPoint presentations on microscopic setup. Yes, ma'am. 
What definition? Oh, specific definition. You're going to have to be louder. Do we have no, I'm just talking. This Friday, we have our last lecture for your analysis okay. on the people, people matter and the study of school. Uh, we will do a lab this Friday on fecal analysis. It's, I just want you guys to do an occult blood. I'm going to have you guys 